Hi, it's Dwyer. Gamblersadvisory.com, free site. DwyerVIP.com, free site. Today is January the 2nd, 2018. Let's talk boxing. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just say, you know, boxing is part of life, right? I believe every gambler needs to think about their own observations of the world around them in handicapping fights. Now, you know a lot of people. There are a lot of people in your life. There are a lot of people who have impacted the way you think. What I want you to do, the first question is ask yourself, look around you. This includes the people you love. How many of them are perfect? Right? How many of them have no flaws whatsoever? Now, I'm sure there's someone who met a fiance two minutes ago who hasn't yet seen her burp, who hasn't yet seen her lose her temper, who is completely convinced that she walks on water and is the greatest thing ever created. Okay, fine. But for the rest of us, even the people you love, aren't there times when you realize that they aren't perfect? Think of yourself. Aren't there times when you realize that you're not perfect? that there are parts of your game that you could improve? Well, when you think about betting on fighters, I believe you have to realize that as good as many of these world-class fighters are, right? Understand that they aren't perfect, right? Think, think back. Wasn't that Sugar Ray Robinson on the canvas against Rocky Graziano? By the way, I'm talking about prime Ray Robinson. Wasn't that Jack Dempsey knocked out of the ring by Louis Firpo? You know what? When Jack Johnson first started out, and I'm only naming great fighters here, he lost some of his early fights. Didn't Bernard Hopkins and Juan Manuel Marquez lose early fights? Understand, at the end of the day, these professional prize fighters are men and women just like the rest of us, right? Prime Ali, dropped by Sonny Banks, Right? They're men and women like the rest of us. They bleed just like the rest of us. Not only are they not perfect, there's some days when they couldn't even beat themselves on their best day. Right, The human condition is such that there's some days when you're better than you are on other days. So, when you're looking at boxing, one of your foundational rules has to be to bet against perfection, right? You have some lines right now that are absurd. I've been talking about it here on some videos. I once saw an over-under. This was shocking to me. That was three and a half rounds for a heavyweight title fight involving a champion who, in my opinion, still green. And that was the Anthony Joshua Dominique Brazil match. Three and a half rounds against a contender? You've got to be kidding me. Right? Understand, at some point, you've got to think to yourself. If Anthony Joshua is an 8 to 1, 9 to 1, or 10 to 1 favorite against a currently reigning unbeaten heavyweight champion, 
Isn't the casino getting ahead of itself? Aren't they pricing this fight for perfection? At a time when, as you look around yourself, you don't see any perfect people. Right? It's ridiculous. Understand. I personally don't think a prime Ali would warrant a 9 or 10 to 1 line against an unbeaten Joseph Parker. Why would I give that designation to Anthony Joshua? Why am I treating Anthony Joshua as if he's a proven Hall of Famer? Right? Let's talk about other aspects of betting. Right? I believe that boxing is a lot like baseball. Now in baseball, you look at these fastball pitchers. A guy who has an A-plus fastball. A-plus. Right? The commentator will tell you that last pitch was 100 miles an hour. Right? You'll think to yourself, my God, this guy throws hard by major league standards. In other words, these professional players, the best of the best, this guy throws hard among that group. But yet you privately know there's a reason why Arales Chapman and Kenley Jensen aren't starting pitchers. You understand there's a reason why they're coming out of the bullpen. It's because big league hitters, if they see that fastball as magnificent as it is, if they see that fastball enough times, they're going to start to hit it. Right? If you don't have the curveball, the off-speed pitch, the knowledge of how to pitch, the ability to keep them confused, right? Throwing change-ups on 3-2 counts and stuff like that. The ability to locate the baseball. If you don't have all of that, then that fastball coming in at 100 miles an hour isn't going to be effective. Not only that, the first time around, a hitter might be overwhelmed by the fastball. He might be expecting something 95 miles an hour. After all, these are big league hitters. And if you're able to throw it 100 miles an hour, maybe that extra 5 miles an hour gets the ball past the hitter. The problem is that's short-lived. Right? Relief pitchers pitch for one or two innings, then they're gone. Because even their managers understand. If they linger out there for three or four innings, if the big leaguer who you just struck out gets a second bite at the apple, that fastball might not be effective. Right? Guys will start anticipating and sitting on the fastball. Right? Fastball hitters are going to think it's Christmas. Right? Giancarlo Stanton hears that a guy is throwing only fastballs. Oh, how long will it be before he says, great, more beer for me. Let me come out here and expect a fastball. Well, let me say... That's the problem I have with unbeaten heavyweight champion Deontay Wilder. He throws a great straight right hand from distance, doesn't he? Just ask Bermain Stavur. Just ask the long list of guys, Malik Scott, who've been hit with it and who've gone down dazed and confused. Right? A great right hand. Spectacular right hand. Now, on the way up, no doubt, a lot of non-contenders and a lot of contenders, as Wilder rose through the ranks, 
were simply unprepared for the punch. Right? Wilder goes through a long stretch of his career where no one goes the distance, kind of like Anthony Joshua right now. Wilder's knocking guys out early, isn't he? But now we're in the part of the water where it's deep. Right? Joseph Parker is unbeaten. Anthony Joshua is unbeaten. Luis Ortiz is unbeaten. Lucas Brown is unbeaten. These guys have seen a lot. These guys are the best of the best. Right? Some of the guys with losses. Alexander Povetkin, for example. Right? He's been in the ring with some heavy hitters. Right? Very heavy hitters. Take a guy like Carlos Tackham. He's fought Joshua. He's fought Povetkin. He's fought Parker. Right? Now, this is the level of opposition that Wilder is going to find himself up against in 2018. Given that for heavyweight championship fights, they're scheduled to go 12 rounds, a distance that remains to Verne made it in his first go-round against Wilder. Why do you believe that Wilder's straight right hand, without much of an inside game, without a spectacular left hook, why do you believe that that punch is enough to get him through 12 rounds against elite heavyweights? Right? Understand, a 100 mile an hour fastball isn't enough to get a relief pitcher through nine innings of a major league game. Why should I, a boxing fan, believe? that it's necessarily going to be enough to get Deontay Wilder through 12 rounds against a savvy fighter with a more diversified game like Luis Ortiz. Right, folks, understand that Arthur Spielka, who I'm guessing is not on the all-time defensive list that you have for heavyweights, made it several rounds into his fight against Deontay Wilder without getting hit by that right hand. Right? Think it through. The cracks are showing already. Right? Stavern makes it through 12 rounds. Spielka makes it into the second half of the fight. Neither Stavern nor Spielka are the kind of guys with the head movement or with the movement in general of someone like Joseph Parker, right? Take a look at Luis Ortiz fights. You're going to notice Luis Ortiz always seems to have his head down around his shoulders, doesn't he? He's a big man, but yet that head isn't just sticking out, <coughs> begging to get hit, right? So, just like I bet against perfection, I'm going to carefully scrutinize fastball pitchers, guys who I think have big punches, who haven't developed the rest of their game. Right? You look at the great fighters, and you're going to find out that they have a bunch of things going for them. These are guys who have worked on different parts of their game. You know, you look at a guy like Floyd Mayweather and people think defense. And I understand the defense is dazzling. But wow, hidden in that defense is an absolutely spectacular left hook. Isn't there? Right? Young Mayweather had blinding hand speed. Folks, look at the Hernando Hernandez fight. Hernandez was the champ entering the ring. 
Mayweather is qualitatively faster than the then reigning champion. Now the idea of Mayweather being as successful as he was with just a big straight right hand and no real inside game, right? No spectacular defense, no great left hook. That'd be preposterous. So why is it plausible at heavyweight? Let me say this too. There's a corollary to the fastball pitcher. Now I understand that James DeGale recently lost his title to Caleb Truax and if I'm DeGale I would have to realize that his problem with Truax is structural. In other words Truax, I know DeGale's just coming off shoulder surgery. I can imagine the people around him are saying, player you were hurt. With a few more months in training camp, you'll be able to come back and beat this guy. Let's exercise this rematch clause. Not so fast. Right? The Gale's not a great athlete. He's a technician. He's outside the box. He's outside the box in terms of what he's trying to accomplish in the ring. Right? He's trying to do more than most fighters. Right? Same thing goes for Terrence Crawford. Same thing goes for Tyson Fury. These are guys who can switch. <clears throat> right? They're righty, they're lefty. You allow them to fight you on the inside, they can stay inside. If they feel that they need to beat you with movement from the outside, they can do that too. Look at the Gale against Andre Durrell in the later rounds. But there are certain matchups, just like there are in baseball, where you can be a great pitcher, but some hitter, for whatever reason, is going to own you. Look at the career stats of the late, great Tony Gwynn against the best pitcher I've seen, Greg Maddox. Right? Tony, for some reason, owned Greg Maddox. Greg Maddox could be dominating everyone else. But then here's Tony Gwynn, and Tony Gwynn, for whatever reason, hit over 300 against Greg Maddox. Right? In boxing, the matchups make the fights. Caleb Truax, who lost to Danny Jacobs, had the perfect style for James DeGale. Right? He was able to get underneath James DeGale inside. He had better stamina than James DeGale. When James DeGale tried to switch, as DeGale does on the fly, between righty and lefty, Truax was able to smother him. Right, folks, that's not going to change. Now, the fact that DeGale has a problem with Truax doesn't mean to me that he would have a problem with whoever wins the George Groves Chris Eubank fight. Right? It doesn't mean to me that he would have a problem with Callum Smith. Right? Understand, this was a guy who was beating Badu Jack before a disastrous 12th round where Badu Jack knocks him down and the fight's ruled a draw. Badu Jack was so big at 168 that he now fights at 175. So, another one of my personal rules for betting is to figure out which fighters are the opposite of fastball pitchers. Which fighters are the hitters who can hit to all fields, who can hit with power but who could also decide to go for doubles, to go for singles, right? When a guy like that loses, you need to understand that he's still dangerous. Maybe he ran into a Greg Maddox, right? James DeGale is someone you need to pay attention to. 
I know many people are saying, hey, DeGale lost. Uh, okay, great. He lost to Truax. That's a bad style matchup for him. If I'm DeGale, I take a little time off of the sport. Then I try to come back against a big name. I'm guessing that the way public mood moves, in DeGale's next fight, if he picks a big enough name, he's going to be an underdog. Folks, that's going to be compelling value. Compelling value. Let me say this, too. You know, life is really, for a lot of people, tribal. Right? They get caught up in being part of a group. And they feel that you're insulting their group if you go against a fighter from that group, right? Now, let me just say my own belief <clears throat> is that we all belong to the human race. I don't believe that there is any group out there that has an inherent advantage over any other group when it comes to fighting. So to me, when I start hearing about things like a Mexican style, I know people like Golovkin like to throw that out, and I know there are many people out there who believe that there's a Mexican style, right? Um, you know, you're in the pocket, you're going for, um, you know, the glory. You're not going to back down. Uh, you have an eye hanging out of your head, and... You're still fighting. You're not going to stop fighting. Um, you know, you're going to fight through adversity. You have a lot of courage. I know the media perpetuates this stereotype. And somehow, it seems to have legs, even though two of Mexico's best fighters ever were guys who knew how to not get hit. Right? Was there a slicker boxer than Salvador Sanchez? Was he not Mexican? I don't, I don't get it, right? What about Ricardo Lopez? Wasn't he pretty slick in the ring? Aren't, aren't Sanchez and Lopez two of Mexico's best fighters ever? Folks, let me say, you know, I remember Oscar De La Hoya in his prime. Isn't he of Mexican descent? I remember Oscar pivoting, shooting a jab, being hard to hit for stretches in bouts. Revisit the last few rounds of his fight against Felix Trinidad. Is he running or is he sticking and moving? Well, you know the rest. Now Oscar's a promoter. So Oscar, who was pretty slick in his day, who could work a guy over from the outside, who used lateral movement to, peep, peep, to beat people like Rafael Ruelas. Now Oscar, as a promoter, understands that there's money to be made talking about mythical Mexican-style boxing. Okay, fine. Whatever. However they want to sell a fight, you know, he has a fighter, Canelo. It's so ridiculous that Canelo's opponent, Golovkin, is saying, hey, I'm the real Mexican. I'm the one who fights Mexican-style. Okay, Whatever. That's how these guys want to play it. <laughs> okay. Whatever. As I've said, guys like Christian Mahares, very slick boxer. Right? I believe he's from Mexico. Um, this marketing is completely separate and distinct from the actual fighters. Right? Because the bottom line is Mexico has a diversity of fighters coming out of the country with several different styles, right? Several different styles. Uh, a guy like Juan Manuel Marquez, hard to hit. I don't, if, if Mexican style means no lateral movement, staying there to get hit and stuff like that, then you're ignoring a big part of the country's history, aren't you? Well, let me say this. Whenever I hear hucksters talking about heavy tribalism and race and ethnicity and stuff like that, 
then I know the prices, the casino odds are going to be mispriced. Right? Those are the fights that you want to gravitate to <laughs> for betting purposes. Because somehow these hucksters have sold some mythology on gamblers that doesn't match reality. So, let me say this. This Canelo-Golovkin rematch. Right? First, let's be real here. Officially, the first fight was a draw. That first fight wasn't a draw. If you saw that fight, you saw one guy chasing down the other guy. Right? The other guy was heroic at times, but then leaves the pocket and is moving away for several rounds and doesn't land more meaningful punches than his pursuer. Is getting hunted down. I'm surprised, quite frankly, Canelo would even want a rematch here. The secret to that first fight is Golovkin's foot speed, isn't it? In other words, Canelo might even be better than Golovkin in the pocket. Right? But he's smaller than Golovkin. Golovkin is able to find him. Canelo isn't a great athlete. He has a problem fighting three minutes of every round. He wants to fight at a measured pace. If you get him out of that, if you don't give him the 20 to 30 seconds every round he needs to rest, <clears throat> he's in trouble. Also, Canelo, both guys hit hard. But Canelo needs you closer to him than Golovkin does to hurt you. Golovkin can hurt you from halfway across the ring. So, I believe this fight's mispriced. I thought Golovkin won the first fight. I don't see why the second fight should be any different. Let me point out, too, that there's only so much fighters can do to change. Right? So, Carl Frotch fights Mikel Kessler the first time. And Frotch, who has a great jab, doesn't throw it enough. Right? Doesn't establish distance. So Mikel Kessler is able to score some points early in that fight. He's able to get close enough to Carl to make the fight more of a shootout than it should have been. Okay. We get to the rematch. Somebody tapped Carl on the shoulder and said, Hey, Carl, what about your jab? Frotch comes out early rounds. He's flicking a great jab. He's establishing distance. Okay. You can see fights like that. You know, you see a guy, Ray Leonard against Duran, right? First fight, Ray somehow forgets that he has the superior legs, right? Second fight, somebody says to Ray, look, Ray, are you going to stand there and get hit by this guy? Or you're going to move around the ring, right? Ray moves around the ring. Okay, I could see those adjustments. I don't believe Canelo can make any adjustments against Golovkin. Because once you get into your mid-twenties, right, you cannot teach yourself to move more, especially when you already have stamina problems. Understand, you know the phrase, something's got to give, right? If I'm in the ring and I decide, oh, I need to move more against Golovkin. I need to come forward more on Golovkin, right? I believe that that's going to mess up your stamina on the back end, right? Let me say, too, that these fighters who are in their mid-20s and older, right? If, if you haven't worked on your defense before then, if you don't have a defensive foundation, Folks, you're not going to develop one at the championship level against championship opponents after you've reached your mid-20s. In other words, we're seeing these guys as they near the finish line of their careers. In other words, these guys were once non-contenders, young guys starting out. Then they came up through the ranks and stuff like that. So now we're seeing them down the stretch if you're in a horse racing, right? We're seeing them at the part of their careers where 
they're fighting other elite fighters. Right? I'm just telling you, at that stage of your career, it's very hard to pick up new tricks. So I don't expect Deontay Wilder to suddenly develop an inside game. I just don't. Nor do I expect Saul Alvarez to suddenly develop a lot of foot speed. So, when you see a fighter who has certain holes in their game, I'm going to mention Saul Alvarez again simply because he's an iconic fighter. Right? Saul Alvarez had a problem with Arislandi Lara. Look at the judges scoring in that fight. Right? Mobile fighters bother him. They move too well. Right? Let me just say, when you see the problems he has against Arislandi Lara, why would anyone believe that he wouldn't have those problems? And he's in middleweight against middleweight champion Billy Joe Saunders. Why does anyone believe he wouldn't have those problems against contender Demetrius Andre? In other words, the guys who can move, they figured out that Canelo has a problem with movement. Right? Canelo's great in the pocket. Spectacular in the pocket. The problem is, what if the opponent doesn't have to come in the pocket to fight him? Right? So, you're in the casino and people start talking about, you know, some cultural style of fighting and stuff like that. Right? You look around and you start realizing that they're really trying to peddle the fight based on ethnicity, cultural background, and stuff like that. So you already should say, hmm, this sounds like a lot of BS to me. Maybe I need to pay attention to this boxing spread in this fight. Then you look at the styles of the fighters. Again, look around you. How many people in your life are perfect? Right? You look at each of these world-class fighters, they all have some imperfections on them, don't they? So I believe the secret to betting is to match the imperfection with a fighter who has that trait. So I see Canelo against Everslandy Lara. I see Lara back away from the pocket. I noticed Canelo couldn't follow him. Right? Canelo, Billy Joe Saunders, folks. You saw Billy Joe Saunders backing away from David Lemieux, who couldn't follow him, didn't have the ring coverage. Right? All I'm saying is, when they announced that Canelo, Billy Joe Saunders fight, you need to be ready to look at the odds in your mind, mentally have odds that you would go for. In other words, if you, like me, feel that Saunders beats Canelo outright, and if they're offering you even money, if you don't even have to pay a premium to pick Billy Joe Saunders, then you need to run and nail down that bet. Understand if the line moves further in your direction, you can always run down to the casino and put more money down on an even more favorable bet. Right? Might even provide a hedging opportunity. So those are just some random thoughts on boxing. Let me just say, I feel Canelo's going to have a problem in 2018 in the rematch against Golovkin. I feel, quite frankly, if Canelo stays at 160, and I believe he has to, because I think losing weight for some fighters is going to be tough, especially after the guy has been fighting above 160. Didn't he fight Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. at 164? Right? I think at 160, Canelo is going to find that He's a little undersized. Doesn't move as well as some of the fighters out there. 
Canelo Danny Jacobs. The best part of Danny Jacobs' fight against Golovkin was when Jacobs from the outside goes southpaw. Right? Confused Golovkin. Jacobs is able to survive. He's able to go the distance. Now, doesn't Danny Jacobs move better than Saul Alvarez? Doesn't he have the skills to stay outside against Saul Alvarez? Right? If you're Saul Alvarez, let's say you lose to Golovkin. If you can't beat Jacobs or Saunders, are you still viable at 160 pounds? Right? That's a big question. Now understand, we've been off-road in this discussion. The public sees things differently. There's a huge portion of the public watching this video that believes that Canelo earned that draw against Golovkin. Just Google it. Right? You're going to see a lot of people out there defending the judges, defending the draw. Right? For them, it's an open question on whether Canelo isn't the best at 160, period, if he isn't better than Golovkin. In my opinion, that public misperception could be worth a lot of money to gamblers on the other side of the play. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. If you want to comment on um, anything I've said, I hope you do so in the comment section to this video. Let me just say too, there's no reason for you to defend anyone in your life. I'm not saying the people in your life are, you know, serial killers. All I'm saying is that for most of us, the people in our lives aren't perfect, just like we have warts, just like we have imperfections, right? So just like the people around you aren't perfect, boxers aren't perfect. Styles make fights. As good as a James DeGale is, there's a Caleb Truax out there who can beat him. Right? I believe the same applies for most of these fighters. If the casino has priced the fighter for perfection, if the casino has priced the fighter the way Prime Ali was priced, or should have been priced, just remember, Prime Ali gets knocked down by Sonny Banks, just remember, perception changes so quickly. I believe Ali was something like a 7-1 to one underdog against Sonny Liston the first time they fought. Right? The odds will change with the weather. The reality remains that all of us have flaws. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.